Okay, folks, it's 1103 and we're really pleased to um, have this presentation about um, uh, some of the hard work done by BSA Life Structures, um, friends of ours that have substantial uh, operations in both St. Louis and Kansas City and their uh, expertise in planning and design and construction know-how uh, have led to a um, really remarkable uh, development in the Kansas City marketplace, one that we've been talking about in Kansas City for um, uh, well more than a decade about the, the absolute opportunities for pediatric research uh, adjacent to Children's Mercy Hospital and uh, that vision of making Kansas City even more of a translational research hub. Um, a key part of that had to do with uh, uh, bringing that, that vision to reality. And uh, we thank you for your participation today in, in Mobio's um, uh, pretty regular uh, monthly series uh, that we have. And I'll uh, point out that our next date is July 28th. And uh, Joe Flynn from Innotiv. Um, and Innotiv is, is the latest iteration, but it's based out of Indianapolis. Uh, but um, original uh, players in that going back to Bassey um, and Seventh Wave Laboratories in Chesterfield, Missouri. So long. Missouri connection with that company. And uh, Joe himself is a um, uh, Missourian and played football at Mizzou and uh, still maintains a uh, farm property up there by Crane's Country Store uh, at the Williamsport exit. Um, so today um, I would like to, um, I got one more, Betsy, what, allowing her to come on in. And I would like to uh, uh, thank Dave Miller, uh, who um, has been working uh, with us. And, and Dave, would you be kind enough to introduce uh, Jackie and, and Aaron today? Uh, I'd be delighted, two of my favorite people. Um, I've never met two people more busier than these two. So I'm, I'm, very, uh, I'm very pleased to brag on them just a little bit. Um, you know, I've been I've been in the design industry for thirty some years now, and uh, science and technology has been my my thing. And um, uh, Jackie and Aaron, um, as part of this, and as really the, the the leaders of the design of this building, I've never seen anything like this before. This is a this is a real game changer, not just in pediatric research or medical research, but in laboratory design altogether. Um, this, this facility is, is beyond state of the art. It breaks new ground. It, it is just a wonderful building. I wish I had anything to do with it. So, um, but uh, uh, Aaron and, and, and Jackie uh, have shown that uh, uh, you know, Children's Mercy now has a facility that's, that's worthy of their reputation research that is going on there is mind boggling um, where um, uh, medical research is going these days. It's just, it's just beyond fantastic. And I think you'll agree that um, the building itself is going to attract the best and the brightest as well as equip those um, that are, that are um, already employed there with all of the tools that, that they need to take it to the next level. So Aaron Fogarty and uh, Jackie Foy, um, take it away. <laughs> How's that? Perfect. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I'm Jackie. Um, I'm an architect here at BSA. And we, um, Aaron and I, tried to um, keep our presentation kind of short and condensed to give opportunity for questions and answers at the end. So I will share my screen and we'll get kicked off and we can kind of walk you through the over um, overarching themes of the project, um, some of the key principles. And um, at the end, there's a short video that talks specifically about some of the key research programs 
um, that were in place prior to the Research Institute um, being completed and uh, that work continues inside the new building. And then we'll have um, time at the end for questions and answers, because um, obviously in 24 minutes, we can only uh, kind of share so much. So if there's anything specific that you have um, in, you know, questions on or um, thoughts, we're happy to address those. So um, I, Kelly, unless there's anything else, I'm happy to share my screen and get us started. Please go right ahead. Thank you for joining us today as we talk about decoding the future and give you a look inside the new Children's Mercy Research Institute. I'm Jackie Foy. I'm an architect with BSA Life Structures, and I was the lead architect and project manager on the Research Institute. And I am Erin Fogarty, and I was the interior design lead for the project. In 2014, the idea began to take shape, and we were asked to design a structure that would be a departure from the current architecture on campus and be the physical representation of the work that would happen inside. With just a few additional parameters, this sketch was the first one that we shared with Children's Mercy. And for the next two years, it became one of the tools they used and share, to help share the vision of the Institute and recruit their current Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Tom Curran. Before we dive in, we wanna give you just a couple of statistics and highlights on the project to help you understand a little bit more about what you're looking at. The project was just under 400,000 square feet. Each floor plate was roughly 4,200 square feet, and we were a nine floor vertical addition on top of an existing parking garage. The project came in at roughly $2 million construction costs, and this first sketch was in February of 2014. Once their chief scientific officer was on board, the first thing we did as we advanced this project was to consider the vision. We wanted to advance the mission of the hospital by increasing quality health care through in research integration. We wanted to make sure that translational medicine with a pediatric influence was top of mind and maintaining and enhancing their brand and quality of care. Community connection and research for all population health and providing opportunities throughout the Institute for the researchers in the community was also a key factor. And the research focus to create and design spaces that allow the Institute to be flexible. We wanted to be able to respond and create research spaces that adapted to the needs of the community and created spaces for collaboration, not just on the research side, but as well as the clinical side of the space. These guiding principles and this vision is what allowed us to propel the project forward. From the very beginning, these guiding principles helped us create flexible and collaborative spaces the idea that we could get research from bed to bedside and back again as quickly as possible. With that idea in mind, the placement of this building was critical. As you can see on this slide, this is the overall campus um, downtown Kansas City at the Adele campus. The north side or the left side of this image is what was kind of deemed the ambulatory um, clinic side as well as the physician and professional offices in the yellow box just above the park. The orange box that you see is where the Research Institute was de decided to be positioned strategically, strategically between the blue side, which is the inpatient services, and the yellow side, which is the providers and the clinic services. This placement on campus and the literal bridge that would connect the providers in the hospital and the researchers together was again, this physical manifestation of translational research where we could go from bench to bedside and back again from bedside to bench. And everyone at CMH, researchers, researchers and clinicians alike were informing research. Going vertical and connecting the Research Institute again was a huge factor and a huge consideration on how we laid out and strategically stacked the floors and to maintain also connection between the hospital and the research building and the bridge over to the POB. POB is located over here to the left. That again is where the clinicians and providers are located. We have a bridge over 23rd Street that connects to this yellow. This is our public floor, it's conference center and cafe that also then connects to the clinic floor over to the hospital. Currently, there is a horizontal connection across the entire campus on first floor. So it was very important that the first floor of the Research Institute maintained that vertical and horizontal connection. From there, we start to stack up. We align our research floors with the existing clinic and research floors over on the right side of the screen. We aligned our mechanical floor here in the center with the existing mechanical on the fifth floor. And once we get above the fifth floor, we really start to break free and the sixth, seventh, and eighth, and ninth floor, floor to floor heights increased from 19 at the sixth floor, and then seven, eight, and nine were 16 foot floor to floors. Obviously below that, we were 
um, tied to the existing hospital with lower floor to floors, 15 foot at the first, 14 at two, three, and four, and 19 again at the mechanical level. You can also see here that we dropped down to grade level, that community, a connection, and having an entry off the street level into the research institute was very important, creating the auditorium space, the sunken garden spaces to allow the community and the hospital like to be able to use the building, and eventually having this discovery center, research science center here for um, schools and children and different communities and groups to be able to come and learn about the science, learn about the research, and share ideas of what they would like to see happen. Another key tenant was a focus on collaboration and flexibility. So even in the first sketches, we started to explore ways that we could lay out the lab floors and create these organic and informal lab spaces, as well as these um, informal and organic meeting spaces that were just outside the labs to help bridge and kind of bring the different scientific neighborhoods together in a more informal way. These ideas started to evolve and we started to test some of the more traditional lab layouts. We started to think about you know, how can we flex these muscles? How can this traditional concept start to evolve? Can we validate this alignment so that we can say, yes, these traditional concepts will promote flexibility in future collaborations? We try to, or do we try to break the mold and think about a more centrally located support spaces, opportunities to improve utilization, looking at lean principles, um, studying workflows. We looked at their um, paths and their steps. We did gimbas with them to understand, you know, what spaces are they using? Where do we have redundancy? And how can we, again, improve that utilization? Thinking about dedicated, or excuse me, thinking about shared spaces rather than dedicated spaces. And as we flex the muscles of these traditional concepts, we start to come to this new idea and we're creating kind of this horseshoe concept where the orange are support spaces, the green are wet benches, and then everything to the top of the page is our office and workspace and kind of getting out of the lab space. Um, the green is from top to bottom. It allows the light to come in. It allows you to be outside of your bench space, but but see into your bench space. And again, those shared orange spaces, shared support spaces and reducing the steps. So if I'm at my bench, you know, I have the same amount of steps here as I do here to get to support spaces, um, freezers, tissue cultures, you know, fume hood rooms, those types of services. And eventually that floor plan and those concepts evolved into what you see here. Um, and this is a typical floor plate of their wet labs. So two, um, the second floor is all dry lab, computational space and looks very much like a traditional office floor. Um, interior offices, workspaces along the perimeter, the same concept that you see here to bring natural light into the space. Our offices were all fronted with glass, so even though they were inboard, they were still able to pull the natural light into their spaces with lower workstations on the outside. Flexible workspaces here that allowed for the light from the outside to come all the way into the lab. It allowed the, allowed the lab technicians to be at their desk, having coffee, having conversation, but still be able to see into their space. And then the big part, and one of the big concepts, is the heart of the home right here in the center. So all the way up the research building from the second floor where we have dry lab, two, three, where we have wet labs, fifth floor mechanical, six, seven, eight, nine dry labs, or excuse me, wet labs. They're all stacked with the heart of the home in the center. This living space, conference space, an open center stair, a shared break room and shared services in the center. Again, bringing both sides of the floor together into a central location. So just really quick to run through the floors one more time for you. The second floor is our dry lab and computational space. The third and fourth floor consisted of wet lab space. We had genomics and clinical pharmacology in their mass spec spaces and sequencing located on the third floor. On the fourth floor was additional wet lab space with their BSL-3 and GMP facility. On the fifth floor was our mechanical floor. The sixth floor was additional specialized lab space. Seventh floor was generic wet lab for recruitment and eight and nine are shell spaces, giving them the flexibility to create lab spaces as the work and the research evolves. Flexibility was beyond the physical space. It was also in the design and the selection of the MEP systems, the exterior facade. In this image, you can see they're hanging a panel of curtain wall. Our curtain wall was a custom unitized system. It was five feet by 15 feet. 
It was fully insulated and had finished back pans. So as they continue to evolve their research, the exterior wall doesn't come into the equation. It's always finished, it's always insulated, and we always have that fire um, perimeter containment system intact. We also explored new technology. We didn't want to be the guinea pigs, but we also wanted to kind of, you know, break the mold a little bit maybe and look at ways that this kind of traditionally energy hog building and research building could be more energy efficient. So we looked at doing equipment upgrades. The first thing we did was expand their energy center. We did um, an expansion of their chillers, boilers, generators, um, a slight expansion to their dock. And some of these upgrades, specifically the one you see here, allow them to receive, see a return on their investment in less than two years, reducing their energy costs by more than $500,000 a year and putting those savings back into operations and research. Creating this more energy efficient building um, was a key component, but also updated technology, updated lab equipment to reduce those expenses, having fume hoods that had sash monitors so we can lower those sashes when those fume hoods weren't in place. Mechanical integration was another key component. Since we have the seventh, or excuse me, the eighth and ninth floor of shell spaces, we knew that eventually we were going to have to bring in new units, new rooftop, or excuse me, new air handler units to the fifth floor. So in this instance, you can see they're flying in the units that were placed on the fifth floor. But the idea that we want to represent here is how modular the curtain wall system is. So on the fifth floor, as well as the sixth floor, there are portions of the curtain wall panel that can be removed to accommodate um, picking and flying in another air handler unit or heavy or larger equipment. So instead of having to dismantle the pieces, um, kind of make it cumbersome to get it up or maybe nearly impossible, we have ways that we can get equipment, um, both mechanical and equipment for researchers into the building in a more efficient way. Another piece in terms of collaboration amongst the design team was the design of the fifth floor. We integrated all of the mechanical needs, both from um, pumps, to DI water systems, to centralized um, lab gases, all to the fifth floor um, to minimize the impact that we would have on the floors when we were building out the lab spaces. So on this instance, on this photo, or excuse me, this slide, you can see the black dashed lines. Over on this side here, this is where our knockout panel is, and this is essentially our racetrack around the fifth floor. It's creating a tunnel both horizontally and vertically for us to move in future equipment and have parking spaces for those equipment pieces of equipment to tie in. Mechanical integration um, and access to the lab space was important as well, creating equipment mezzanines to get into specialized and highly clean spaces without having to actually get in them, putting all of the air valves um, access to the lighting and everything up above the actual lab. So the um, facilities crew and the engineering team can get up here and service the lab without having to go into these ultra clean facilities. The interior design of the Research Institute also reflects the cutting edge research that is done within the facility. It was important to children's to continue their strong branding in the Research Institute, but since this building has such a different function, we were able to create a pediatric twist on translational medicine by incorporating children's kid-friendly color palette, but in a more sophisticated way. Science was the basis behind all the design elements throughout the facility, and since patients and families can have access to the CMRI, all of the features and artwork have plaques with descriptions about the science that inspire them. This not only, only benefits the visitors, but but it also inspires everybody that comes through the, through the building. The Discovery Cafe is located at the heart of the CMRI, like Jackie mentioned, on the first floor. The connection to the hospital is on this floor, which allows patients and families from the hospital to come over to the CMRI and visually see the science and the research being done and the researchers behind it. The cafe ceiling represents just one of the science-inspired design elements. The ceilings are backlit, custom perforated metal panels that exhibit an artistic impression of overlapping dendrites and biological patterns. The pediatric influence in the bright colors and space encourage families to come over from the hospital and share the space with the researchers. The artwork and interior features were truly 
inspired by science and can be understood not only by the researchers, but they also engage the kids and the families that come through the space with their colorful alterations of actual science. These, these images here are actual slides that we were able to um, get from Children's Mercy that they, actual research slides that, that they were able to give us. And um, one example is how we took this slide of a brain anatomy study and recolored the image to coordinate with the second floor color palette while still keeping the image itself unchanged and literal. This slide shows an actual installation of that science artwork. Dr. Curran has always encouraged the design team and researchers to reflect on their work. This slide just shows just one of many open collaboration spaces with acoustical panels designed to reflect DNA sequencing, also another science-inspired design. It provides pops of color throughout the space. These are just subtle reminders of the importance of the work being done every day at the CMRI. In addition to the design elements, there are also framed photos of actual patients scattered throughout each floor that have been affected by the research done at Children's Mercy. The photographed children are an inspiration to continue to advance translational medicine. The last key component of the Research Institute that we'd like to touch on today is the concept of research for all. Again, going back to the guiding principles and the key tenants that Dr. Curran and his team wanted this building to invoke was that this building is not just for the, the researchers inside, but for the community, for the entire Kansas City area and even beyond. So one of the first things was, what does this building evoke when you look at it? What do you, what do you feel and what do you think? And so as you can look at the exterior of this building, the physical shape and the undulations and the curve of the building represent the twisting DNA. The monumental stair on the west side of the campus, the vertical, tall vertical element with the red lighting, had seen many iterations. If you think back to that original sketch we shared with you, it was this twisting spire standing in front of the building. And as the design evolved, it moved over to the west side and really anchored the building down to the streetscape to encourage the community to, the community to interact with the building. The monumental stairs, clear vision glass, again, another scientific opportunity to inspire design. The stair is physically um, structural, to support the monumental stair, but it also gives the illusion of the twisting helix inside the stair. Engaging the community with the DNA sequence on the building, there's opportunities with high schoolers and other um, STEM programs to actually decode this building to determine what is the sequence, what is the red mutation that shows up in the, in the facade of the building. The auditorium is at the entry level that Jackie just mentioned, so it, it actually encourages the community to come into the building and utilize this space as well as the people working in the building. Not only will the room be used for conferences, but it was also designed to allow for mu musical performances and other community events. The shape of the room also, again, is inspired by design by science with its shapes and textures. The shape of the room mimics the form of a cellular wall structure and the three textured walls were inspired by the never-ending pattern of the fractal. Children's commissioned art from local Kansas City artists. The action committee based its decision on artistic excellence and originality and evidenced by and evidenced by craftsmanship and skill. The pieces were also to meet the goal of honoring integrated science and art with children's health and well-being in mind, as well as children's mission and vision in mind. Each piece that was selected has a wonderful story of inspiration behind it, which is displayed on a plaque next to each of the pieces. One other key component to community connection we wanna share with you are the gardens. There is a rooftop garden as well as a sunken garden that are part of the overall project. This rendering here that you see will be the rooftop garden slated to finish in September of this year. It provides connection to what is considered the discovery portal, which will eventually be an interactive space to engage the community on the research that's happening inside the building. This rooftop garden, again, is inspired by science-based patterns and shapes and forms, and it provides a respite space, not just for researchers, but patients and families in the community visiting the space in the building. We'd like to take this opportunity to share a quick four minute video with you. This was recorded about this time last year. It gives you a look inside the Research Institute as it was nearing completion, but it also shares with you some of the key research neighborhoods and research initiatives happening inside the building.
We're building the Children's Mercy Research Institute here in Kansas City to help us find answers to those diseases which affect children. Children's research is very badly funded throughout the U.S. And so with help from donors like yourselves, we're able to do that research here in Kansas City. A unique thing of the Research Institute is how it's strategically positioned on the campus here at Children's Mercy. We're able to provide translational research from the bench to bedside and back again. One of the driving forces behind the Research Institute is collaboration in all things research. So we wanted to make sure that the design of the building reflected that tenant held true by Dr. Curran and Dr. Pemberton. So as you look through the building, you'll notice clear views through the glass, through the labs, science on display, and open spaces for researchers to meet and talk and discuss. We're on the second floor of the Research Institute, and this is the dry lab floor. The hardcore, analytical, computational work is happening on the dry lab space. It's an opportunity to understand population health and really dissect that data. We're now on the third floor in what is going to be the new Genome Center. So as you probably know, the Children's Mercy Genome Center is nationally recognized and actually internationally known. So one of the new projects that we've got going is Genomic Answers for Kids. And with that, we're going to be able to sequence 30,000 genomes of kids who come to Children's Mercy Hospital with some sort of genetic anomaly that we can assess. And then we'll also be sequencing all of their parents and their siblings to generate a database of 100,000 genomes. We're going to help kids like Caden and Ty. They had a super rare disease and no one could figure out what it was. Helping families like that is what the Genomic Answers for Kids program is all about. What we will achieve uh, through this program is much shorter time to diagnosis for families that have often waited for years. And that's really the key aim of our program. What it says about the hospital and about people that are donating to the gene study it says that they care about every single human life, that it doesn't have to affect hundreds of thousands of people or even thousands of people. It, if it just affects one person, they care. This is the Precision Therapeutics Program. This is where the Goldilocks Program will be run out of, which is run by Dr. Steve Leader and Dr. Sue Rama. So the Goldilocks Program is a program which looks at not, not too much drug, not too little drug, just the right dose of drug for each individual patient. One example of the work that we do in precision therapeutics is what Dr. Leader and Dr. Raman are doing, working on a decision support tool to provide point of care precision medicine dosing for kids. My dream is to have these resources available to any clinician for whom prescribing medications is part of what they do. And what we need to do is have the capability to rapidly develop these tools so we can accelerate the pace at which they make it to the bedside. So we're up on the fourth floor, and this is the GMP, which stands for Good Manufacturing Process. This is an area where we actually do a lot of human tissue cell culture. Uh, at the moment, we have to send our T cells down to the Baylor School of Medicine in Houston to get those cells grown up for the CAR T cell therapy, which we actually do here at Children's Mercy. Doug Myers is our oncologist who does that work. And now, once this facility opens, he'll be able to come up two floors, walk into this room, and grow those cells up right here in Kansas City. We're still here on the fourth floor of the new building. We're stood outside the Biological Safety Level 3, BSL-3 facility. So BSL-3 are for organisms that actually are pretty dangerous to humans. We don't actually have any BSL-3 organisms on site, but for example, COVID-19, would be a BSL-3 organism. So we have some folks doing some COVID-19 research at the moment, but once this building is open, they'll actually be able to use this facility for that work. Thank you for your commitment to the kids and for everything you've done to help us with this facility. Thank you for making this dream a reality for so many people and for all the pediatric patients to be benefited from this building. We look forward to seeing you in the spring and introducing you to the finished Children's Mercy Research Institute. Thank you everyone for your time today. We hope you enjoyed learning more about the Children's Mercy Research Institute and the forces and the collaboration and the vision behind it. Well, Aaron and Jackie, that was, uh, this is a really exciting development. And uh, so the, the amount of work that was comprehensively put into this and, you know, tying in basically all the buzz phrases that are that are anchoring the science around the world of computational biology generic uh, i'm sorry genomic medicine the car t cell therapies bsl level three um, uh, uh, secure laboratories um, what an exciting opportunity to to bring that into place for the benefit of children that are right there in kansas city but but the world over um, Tell, tell us about how um, the 
the COVID experience of, of mm -hmm. a building during that period uh, and, and, and I, I would assume finalizing much during that period, uh, did, did you have to, to make some adapt adaptations based on staffing and, and proximity of researchers and, and elements like that that you think others would like to know about? Sure. So I think um, one of the big things was obviously we were in the middle of construction and actually nearing completion um, when the mandates came in place for Kansas City, Missouri um, for kind of the lockdown and everyone to stay at home. So there was a short period of time on site where we were um, at a standstill kind of waiting direction and the hospital and the contractor were very proactive with the city um, and had meetings with the mayor to deem the project essential so it could continue to move forward because it was at this critical path where you were we were enclosed um, we were nearing completion and you know that was March and we completed the project in September so there was just a short window left on this long-term project um, so we did continue to move forward and what then happened is there were just a lot of different measures put in place um, social distancing on the floors as they were finishing construction with hand washing stations masks required um, temperature checks for all of the um, contractors when they came on site in the morning um, and then same for the design team when they came on site as well. And um, the hospital and the contractor worked really well um, to manage that on site in terms of keeping construction moving. And so we were able to move um, smoothly to the finish line. We were very fortunate that a lot of our, um, we did have, so the, I guess I'll say the fractal panels that you saw in the auditorium, those were um, a product that was manufactured in Italy. And luckily we had already, uh, left there and were through customs. So some of those types of longer lead items had already reached kind of the states at that point in time. So that really helped our schedule as well. Um, and what's somewhat unique about this building is that, um, as we mentioned, Dr. Kern and Dr. Pemberton um, were very forward thinking in how they wanted researchers um, to interact. And so the idea of creating workspaces without boundaries as much as possible, as much as you can do that in a lab and research environment was really, I think, a key to their success, both pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, there are so many different types of spaces to work in within a research floor um, outside of that lab space that it gives them the flexibility. They kind of have, they, we created areas for social interaction, um, created areas for collaboration, created enclaves and areas for people to have focused work if they wanted to get out of their office. And so while that was the idea behind that wasn't, you know, based around COVID and new hybrid and new work environments, it was solely based on um, kind of meeting people where they needed to be balancing expectations for kind of individual work and what's best for the team and kind of marrying that up in this work environment. And it's, it's really translated well um, as they return back to the office and to return back to the building. someone help us uh, uh, understand um, the extent of, of, of the staffing pressures that'll, that will now be on Children's Mercy Research? Uh, I'm assuming that these are not all new hires, that, that they had substantial um, uh, researchers um, in uh, spaces probably all over the other clinical facilities. And, and uh, but still this is a, a, a very large structure and it takes a long time to, to to fill these through to completion and uh, to fulfill the vision yes very very much so um so they had research floors on the third and floor third and fourth floor of the clinic and research building which is the one that's just to the south of the cmri and connects um, they also had their clinical pharmacology located on the ground floor inside the hospital. Um, and then a lot of their other research programs were over in Crown Center. So they were leasing space from Hallmark. Um, and so that allowed them to get everyone consolidated into one place. So the advantage there is they were able to, you know, let go of lease space in Crown Center, um, let go of a high dollar eye occupancy space in the hospital, and then get everything um, consolidated in, in one area. So right now, um, 
like population health and their informatics, which is located on the dry lab and second floor, they were all over at Crown Center. So they vacated that space and they're slowly starting to move back in. So they were one of the first groups to move in in October last year. And they basically moved out of Crown Center and then went back home. <laughs> and now they're slowly starting to come back on the floor. Um, and then the next floor to move over was genomics. They're on the third floor. They were over also in Crown Center and they never really stopped. So they, um, what they ended up doing is when they moved over to CMRI, they would flip their work schedules. So, you know, Monday, Tuesday, everyone was essentially home on Wednesday and then they'd flip Thursday, Friday. But that is the one area of the lab um, in terms of forecasting growth has, that's really met those goals. They're uh, very quickly starting to see that they're going to need more space, um, which is part of the reason that we left eight and nine shell spaces so that we could understand who's growing and where does where do those needs, um, how are they going to shift. So they're seeing a growth in um, on the dry, dry lab side where the information that's coming out of the sequencing piece, the ability and the need to, um, you know, analyze the data and do the computational analytical work is increasing. So the lab bench and that, that uh, ratio between researcher and bench has stayed consistent, but the ratio between um, dry and wet is continuing to increase with the growth of that uh, genomics program. So we're starting to see that need already, um, but they do have some um, space that they're still growing into. So it'll, it'll take some time for them to fill up this building. Um, but that was the intended purpose. They didn't want to build specific labs for everything they have today. They wanted to leave some shell space. So if there's a research program or a type of research or a type of lab that they don't have, they don't they didn't want to be shoehorned into where they couldn't provide that in the future. The other thing too that we didn't talk about at all on the video was um, they did transition away from fixed benching and all their benching is mobile um, with all the services from above. So that's allowed them as you know, one researcher needs more space and the other doesn't, they can kind of grow and flex in their current space without always having to default to building out new and new and more space. Do we have any more comments uh, or questions from the floor from attendees? Hey, Kelly, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Robert Blaine. I'm with Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, I live in St. Louis. I grew up in Kansas City, so you know, really excited to see this uh, infrastructure coming um, to the Kansas City area. And just you know, Jackie, Aaron, this building is absolutely stunning. I mean, I'm just my jaw is kind of on the floor right now. And so we'll be really excited to see it, you know, fully open and operational. And just you know, kudos to you and your teams um, and David and all you've done to, to make this a reality. And I can, I'm not a, a researcher or a, a architect or a designer, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm just, just curious when I see, you know, uh, you know, kind of landmark projects like this, you know, what were the biggest one or two challenges you encountered throughout the project and what did you do, you know, to overcome them? It could have been a structural issue or just a community buy-in issue. What, what were the big roadblocks and, and uh, how did you resolve it? Um, I'll share one from an architecture's perspective and then I'll let Erin um, share one if she has any, but I think um, it was kind of an, one of the most inter interesting challenges I think was um, I've been fortunate to be able to work with children's for quite some time and they have a very strong vocabulary on campus in terms of their architecture. Um, and so I think Initially, one of the biggest challenges was um, in February of 2014, which is when we did that first sketch that you saw, um, the request was, you know, we're going to make good on our mission, our research mission, we're going to do this, like, we're committed to it, but we, we mean business is kind of what their thought was, and, and we want a building that really speaks to the, the things that are going to happen inside. We want people to understand that this is cutting edge. This is for everyone. We want the, the architecture to reflect that. Um, and so they said it doesn't have to have brick. And I, I wasn't sure what to do with myself because <laughs> I'm not used to that um, down there. Um, and so it was just, you know, it was an exciting challenge because it was a huge opportunity to be able to provide a design um, and a structure that was um, indicative of where they're headed with research. 
um, someplace innovative, um, someplace that is going to help pioneer pediatric research. Um, and so it was it was an exciting challenge to be able to really allow ourselves to push the envelope and think about a design that enhanced their brand, um, but also allowed them to kind of set a trend and step into the future and be a, a, a leader in that arena. Um, the, 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 uh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was going to ask another question. Oh, I was going to go ahead, Dave. Um, there's there's so many layers of this building. I keep finding out more and more myself all the time. And and and, and one of the things is um, the exterior of the building, the lights. I heard a really interesting story. I'd like for you guys to tell it about what that pattern is on the outside and as it related to opening and who threw the switch. You know what I'm talking about? I do, yes. Erin, do you wanna finish answering your question and then I can talk about the lights a little bit? Sure, just the challenge on the interior side I think was a, a positive challenge, but it was Dr. Curran and Dr. Pemberton pushing for that real, real science and design. And so there were several several ideas that we pushed to them and, and they would say, you know, we need it even more literal. We want, we want the researchers to look at this and really understand what it is like for example, a helix, you know, some, something might, might be a little bit off. It had to be really literal. And so I think it was a challenge to us to get it to the point where they were satisfied with it, but it just made the overall design even better in the long run, so. That's very cool. Um, Jackie, I wrote that down, strong vocabulary with architecture coming from WashU. I wouldn't know anything about that. So you're <laughs> A diplomat in addition to being an architect. So anyway, thank you for sharing. You're, you're I really welcome. enjoyed the presentation. Good. Um, to just respond to Dave's comment. Um, so um, on the exterior of the building at night, um, it is illuminated. So during the day, there's those slight panels of glass that are just um, very subtle. Um, you know, if it's overcast, you may not notice them when you're looking at the building from the east as strongly as you would from the west. So there's just a slight variation in the color and the reflective um, film that's on the third uh, third surface of the glass. Um, and it was intentional. So Dr. Kern wanted you to discover the pattern. He wanted you to have to kind of look and, and discover what was on the building, just like researchers are discovering the mutation that's in the DNA sequence that's actually on that building. So um, the first four floors, um, you have a sequence, then you have the mechanical level that's separated by the louvers, and then on the top four floors is another sequence. Those sequence are from actual patients. They are actual literal DNA sequences that we had reviewed many times with the researchers to make sure that we did not overlap them. Um, and then at night, when the lights turn on, that sequence is illuminated, and the red light is the mutation within that patient that was discovered at Children's Mercy. And that mutation was discovered and then treated um, at Children's. And um, the one of the patients who has their, mutate, their DNA up on the building is the one that actually um, flipped the switch to turn on the lights for the grand opening back in February. Um, so the other cool thing is, as many of you probably are aware, um, Kansas City um, is a very um, supportive city. So, you know, pink for breast cancer. Um, this this month we've seen lots of rainbow colors. We've had blue for the Royals, red for the Chiefs, and Children's is obviously kind of on that south end of the downtown core. And so now they're able to be part of that vocabulary. They're part of that language. Um, they're red with the Chiefs now. They're blue with the Royals, and they can kind of talk back to the city and be part of the community. And so that was a huge piece of being able to illuminate the building. Um, and that was also honestly one of the big pieces behind the energy efficiencies of the building, that there were things that they wanted to do to be part of the community, but they wanted to be respectful about the energy that they were using and how they were doing it. So there was a big push to try to offset some of those costs. Um, so that's just a really exciting story to be able to literally share some of the research and discoveries that are happening inside the building. Well, I think it goes without saying that um, Kansas City, in fact, the entire region is, we're incredibly fortunate to have 
Children's Mercy um, uh, had this new opportunity to, to move forward. Um, the namesake of the entire campus is Adele Hall. Um, I think she would be exceptionally well pleased with um, uh, the thoughtfulness and the seriousness with uh, how you guys attacked this and have left something that um, uh, this is obviously a very, very special project. And uh, congratulations on significant role that you all played in it, Aaron and, and, and Jackie and the entire BSA team. Uh, looks like you really rose to the challenge there. Thank you. It was, yeah. it was an honor. It's just very meaningful to be able to create something um, that's going to be home to a place for people to do their best work. Or kids that deserve it. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So well, thank you for allowing us to share. It's an exciting story and we're very honored. Well, we will. Um, this recording will be uh, th this program, this special, uh, as Dr. Rick would say, uh, uh, this, this television show uh, <laughs> will be recorded and maintained on the Mobio site. So for those of you that were pleasantly surprised or blown away or jaws are still on the floor, uh, please reference this and, and drive us, uh, drive folks to get to see this uh in, incredible presentation so it'll be posted later this afternoon thanks so much everyone thank you